yesterday, before I started yesterday, my instinct, which surprised me, was to go through what we did, and then to stop at the end of the, when I talked about the peony, and then brought you to that point where I could show you that you could now tick off a box on your syllabus to recognise diversity as creative unity. I emphasise how we all, all acknowledge diversity, but we don't see that that is simultaneously unity. And when I was thinking about it beforehand, I had this sense, yes, well, I could stop there. Uh, that's a very good place to stop. Because I've really done it there. The essential thing they have to see is now is, is there the dynamical unity of self-differencing, the self-differencing organ producing multi self as multiplicity and unity, each of which is the same one but differently and all that. It's there. So I don't really need to go any further than that. Uh, and then I suppose I don't know why but I, I think I thought, well, we're going to have more on Goethe next week. And I'm in a way, I suppose I ought to say a bit more about this wretched prefix you are and the urogan, which is what we've been doing but never needed to use the name, or the urflanza, which we'd come to and we, we hadn't come to. And I thought, well, I suppose I ought to say a bit more about that. And then, of, of course, it got more tricky. Um, against my instinct, I did this, and it was very interesting that by the end of the afternoon, I just simply lost contact with the whole thing. And I lost connection, and I just went into free fall. And I couldn't tell what I was doing. Um, and I thought, oh, bugger. Um, I really should. I've stuck with my instinct and stopped at the end of the peony. But well, it's too late now because I thoroughly confused them um, with all that stuff at the end on Plato, etc., etc. Uh, and then this morning I had a very interesting experience. I was working up at uh, uh, half past six or just gone after half past six it was a little clock. I set the alarm for quarter to seven and the alarm hadn't gone half past six. And um, I got up. I heard voices downstairs making quite a bit of noise. And I thought, what well, are they making noise for at this time in the morning? Then they got more noisy and then there's lots of moving chairs around and God knows what and so on. Anyway, eventually it dawned on me, I'd overslept, and it was an hour later than <laughs> I thought it was, and I'd misread the clock. I hadn't actually set my alarm when I went to bed last night. And I got out of bed in great shock, and thought, oh my God, because I, I had a wonderful evening with, uh, last night at Phillips, and I thought, oh my God, I've really got to focus on what I'm doing today. And then it suddenly dawned on me, um, the thing which was just so obvious that we had actually in what we'd been doing yesterday which I hadn't brought out well at the end because I got lost what we had been actually doing was the archetype we, we, had, we had been doing it all along the whole thing and I remember a chap in California Dennis Klosek and um, he said this, and I, I, I gave a talk at his place in Sacramento, 1996, and we got on very well. And um, he, in a book he wrote, and this is after I we'd had some further meetings and so on and that, he wrote something in a book which I thought was a very, very neat, neat summary of this. And, and uh, yesterday, I would actually jotted this down on a piece of paper, just to remind me of this. And I showed it on the bench over there, of course, completely forgot about it. Um, what, what, it what it said is quite simple. What Dennis said, <coughs> the archetypal organ, which he puts in quotes, is two things simultaneously. 
a movement in which it is one and yet becomes different at the same time. Which, of course, is exactly what we've been doing all day yesterday. <clears throat> a movement in which it is one and yet becomes different at the same time. Now, the point is, <clears throat> that is the archetype. That movement. And that's the key thing about it. Um, <clears throat> it's a movement. <clears throat> it's the movement, that thing of Bredis, becoming different in order to remain itself. That's life. Uh, all the time we had this organ, which is self-differencing organ, producing the difference of itself, each of which was the same as itself. <clears throat> so, the key thing is, it's the archetypal movement. Then I remembered I'd sort of focused on this in 2006. And <clears throat> came, all came back to me when Anna from Norway, Anna from Norway via Malta was here. And I happened to have my notes with me for 2006, and I took it out and found it. And we, we did it absolutely clearly there in 2006, focusing, focusing on this. So I was very pleased about this, because I thought, this is what happens. The more you do things, the more confused you get. Um, this is a problem, actually. You, you, with everything, you come to a point where things go right. Then you have to carry on, and actually it goes downhill from there onwards. It's very interesting. 2006, I'm not saying you're not a great year. I haven't evaluated you yet. <laughs> but 2006 was a good, for me, I thought it was a great year. Do you think that? You can't say I can. I wasn't there. You weren't there. Oh, but it can't have been a good year, then you were. <laughs> but, um, I, yes. Yeah, it was certainly a turning point year, yeah. Yes, it was, wasn't it? Mm. That's, that's, I mean, it was a turning point. And actually, it is true. And since 2006, every year has been good. Yeah. They have. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I really mean that. I'm not just saying that. They have all been good. But I remember 2006 especially because it really was different and things really took off that year. Um, that was it. So, <clears throat> certainly the last year and the year before. But people were saying every year gets better. Mm. And that's probably true. <coughs> but I just happened to remember 2006 specifically because that, that's the first year it got really good. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, <clears throat> the key thing is here... You see, we talk about the, uh, the archetype. This goes back to what I said about in English. The word being can be a noun or it can be a verb. Now, we talk about the archetype. The archetype makes it a noun. And in all the literature everywhere, it's the archetypal organ or the archetypal plant. So it's a noun. So that makes you think there's an archetypal entity. And... This is a dreadful thing. People were always going on at me because I'd written about Goethe. Uh, they, they wanted to know what this archetype of entity was and how you could find it and so on. Like, oh, well, actually, if you look just behind the cupboard over there, you'll find it's hidden behind there and so on. And, that. Um, and the thing is, it is not an entity. It actually is a movement. And it's, it's what we've been describing all along. We have actually all the time been describing the archetypal movement. So that's the archetype. We have been describing the plant archetypally all the way through. It's the dynamic unity of self-differencing is the archetype. But it's not the archetype. What happens is you have to see archetypally, which brings us right back to the basic work on phenomenology catching, seeing in the act. You see the giraffe when you see giraffely. You see a chair when you see chairly, whatever. You see the archetype when you see archetypally. And when you see archetypally, you're not seeing something like the giraffe. What you experience is th this movement, this dynamical unity of movement of the self-differencing organ producing the difference of itself, which are also the same as itself. The one becoming many, remaining the one. This movement, this self-differencing movement, that is the architect. When you see in this way, that is when you think in this way, when you experience in your thinking this movement, then you are experiencing the archetype, because you are then experiencing archetypally. 
it's completely participative, as these things always are, of course. And it's just like the giraffe. You only see the giraffe when you see giraffely. But then you think you're seeing a giraffe there, an object. It's actually in the seeing. Here with the archetype, it's the same. When we see archetypally, we see the archetype. But then we make the mistake of thinking it was an archetypal object. And the reason we have so much trouble with this one is because it's frustrated by the object thing because there really isn't an object because the archetype actually is the movement. It, that is why we come back to this central point. Goethe's thinking is intrinsically dynamic and it takes a long time to get the sense of what that phrase really means because you think you know what it means and, and you, you haven't got it. it he, he came to this because his thinking was totally dynamic. So that's very important, what we've actually been doing here, you see, all along with this work on the plant yesterday, we did the whole day on it. All of that work we were doing on learning to see the plant was all working phenomenologically. It's exactly what we'd done the day before, with all that stuff of the cube and or, or the hidden figure and all that stuff, and Galileo and the moon, just things. that we're working in that way ourselves yesterday. But, but because we were in it, we don't notice that's what we're doing. So, and I also realise, of course, that in what we were doing yesterday, because I did bring this out, this whole business about distinction was very, very important. So that's what we did on uh, Tuesday, was this, the act of distinction. So what this work has done here, what the plant with Goethe, is it has brought together what we did on Tuesday, distinction, distinction relation, and now seeing it intensively instead of just extensively. And it's brought together the phenomenology, the act of seeing, which we did on, on Wednesday, all brought together in this work on learning to see the, learning to see the plant as it lives, or learning to think like the plant lives. We go to uh, Craig Holridge's <coughs> phrase, I'm sorry, learning to think like the plant lives. It is, um, it's very simple then. We see the archetype when we see archetypally. But when we see archetypally, we realise this is a movement, and so there is no archetype as an entity. So talking about the archetypal organ, or the ar archetypal plant, is actually very, very, very confusing and misleading. But it's inevitable that people will do this, unless we get to understand. And that isn't as we discovered for ourselves, isn't at all easy. Uh, so, uh, um, and that's what partly led me into the problem, yesterday, because I then had to get into this wretched word, archetype, which I, don't, I could perfectly well have ignored that word because we'd actually done it, and we'd done it better than people who write about archetypes who didn't do it. But since that word is there in this domain, uh, it's very hard to ignore it. And, of course, that brings in the whole business of Platonism, which then turns out to be not Platonism at all. That's another complication. And at one time, I tried to skim over that. I used to say, well, look, people have misunderstood Platonism, but it's the misunderstood Platonism that we call Platonism. So, but I gave a, a lecture in America somewhere. I can't remember the place. It was, oh, oh, it was weird. Um, but in the audience was Ron Brady, the man I mentioned yesterday. And that was the first time I met him, and I knew he was going to be there, I've been told. He lives locally. I thought, ah, fantastic, I'm going to meet the great Ron Brady, that's fantastic. So I gave this lecture, and I, 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 someone pointed out to me who Brady was. And then the lecture, he comes up to me, I thought, oh, fantastic. And he just ripped into me for, for misrepresenting Plato. And he said, don't you realise that Plato didn't do that at all. Uh, haven't you understood this? Haven't you studied Plato's Parmenides, etc., etc.? He was very angry. And I thought, could cut that. I said, well, well, I do sort of know that, but you realise what I'm doing? I'm actually using what people think of as Platonism. They said, well, it's not good enough. <laughs> and so I said, I was such a shock. And off he went. Anyway, two days later, 
I, I, I had been invited to dinner on the Sunday night at someone's house, and they said, oh, Ron Brady's going to do that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I went there, he was as nice as anything. And we got on like a house on fire. Uh, no reference to this whatsoever. And I mentioned this later to someone, and I said, oh, that's Ron, he's like that. <laughs> that's it. But he took it very seriously. So, I, I, of course, one of the main people who has brought out the fact that Plato was not a Platonist, and the views attributed to him were probably not his views, is Hans Georg Gadamer, who was one of the major 20th century philosophers. He was associated with Heidegger, and then he went on to develop what's called philosophical hermeneutics. He's not, he's even heard of in England. He's very famous in continental Europe. He died now, he died in, at the age of 102 in, in 2002. And he was continuing philosophical work to the end. He, I mean, his lectures that he gave, seminars he gave when he was 90 are just formidable. He, he, he just was a real philosopher. And a great deal of what he did was to show that Plato had been misunderstood. And uh, there are later dialogues of Plato, it's a very difficult one, which nobody reads because it's very difficult, called the Parmenides. And this is the one that Ron said, that's the key to the whole thing. And this is well known, the academics will tell you, this is Plato criticising his own theory. You see, they present him like an academic. He put forward this theory, and now he puts forward the self-criticism of the theory, pointing out there are some difficulties with it, sort of like an academic would do. Now, what Gardner pointed out was he was doing the very opposite. That, uh, that later dialogue, Parmenides, is written to show people that they got hold of the wrong end of the stick. They got the wrong end of the story about what he was doing all along. Uh, not to criticise his own theory, but to say, look, you haven't got it. And the, it is widely accepted that Plato's way of presenting things had itself been a major contribu contributor, contribution to the misunderstanding. Um, that it's in the way he actually put it, uh, led people down the wrong path, and he later tried to correct that. But since the Parmenides is so difficult, nobody reads it. So what's come down historically is the misunderstanding of Plato, the two-world theory. There is, there is a, a distinction, as in mathematics, but without a separation. But he, I said yesterday, that was quite decent what I said there yesterday, methodologically you make the separation to, for doing mathematics. But then that got ontologized. And so then what you have, you've got this peculiar picture that when they talk about the archetype, we have this very strange thing where you've got these two levels. And let's suppose you're talking about oh, the archetypal something or other. I don't know, we've got organs there, something there, something there, something there. And here they are, all on one level. And then up here, a uh, world of its own, quite different. You've got the archetypal organ or the archetypal plant and you've got this big separation there and that's the two worlds and somehow or other that gets copied to there or it's never quite clear how it happens and how that gap can be overcome. So consequently when people talk about an archetypal plant or an archetypal organ they make it an entity, put it into place, it, Pseudo-Platonism, the two-world picture, which is pseudo-Platonism, false Platonism, stick it into some kind of heaven. And they say, oh, that's the spiritual plant or something or other. But this is not what Goethe's talking about, because anyway, that's not spiritual, that's pseudo-spiritual, as a matter of fact. Um, that's not what he's talking about at all. Uh, and this is, the whole discussions about Goethe are bedeviled by this her whole problem. Uh, and of course, as I said, the other thing which I mentioned before, is quite often people think, well, what he actually meant was what all the plants have in common. You remember I did that too, what they all have in common. Let's do that as a square. Uh, what they all have in common. And they think that's what he meant by the archetype. Mm -hmm. So that's not, that's not platonic, it's an average plant. And it, uh, the ground plan, that's what he meant by it. Um, and that's all right, you can do it. He doesn't mean that, but you can do that. And that was done in biology in Britain in the 19th century. But various discoveries made that contribute homologous organs. Through doing this, they came to understand that the, um, 
the, the, the wing of a bird. It's a pentadactyl limb, isn't it? The, the wing of the bird is homologous to the, uh, to, to the human hand, is analogous to the, um, to the flipper of the, of the what? What's got flippers? Um, uh, what's got a, a seal, is it, or something like that? Is it? Uh, walrus, dolphin, dolphin the, those flippers there are analogous to the hand, analogous to the wing of the bird. It's called hom homologous organs. Now that, actually, that discovery of homology uh, in comparative anatomy was actually made by people who actually produced this kind of ground plan. So it is not without its methodological merit. Again, methodologically, this turns out to be a good thing to do. Ontologically, no. Because then what they did, and this is the second thing, they then back projected that up there and said that must have been there at the origin, that's the thought of God, it's transcendental. That's different to the kind of Platonic archetype because it's drawn it off here and back projected it. The Platonic one's already the idea of so, so there's quite a lot of different, there's no one single picture here, there are different, different uh, versions of it. But this is what the British did, and they did ontologize it. Richard Owen, the great man, the, the top man in British biology before Darwin, was, sort of, was really in charge of everything, he wanted to see these as being transcendental. And it was then called transcendental anatomy, because they put it up there and idealized it and said these are the thoughts of the, in the mind of God, like the laws of physics. Uh, and so on, and they had there was a whole historical background for this. And actually, um, it came through from the later Coleridge, uh, the, the poet who was very keen on German philosophy, and he had a protege called Henry Green. And Henry Green was a surgeon, they were surgeon, and he's, he was the man that taught Owen. So there's a whole again in British life at that time. There's about 30, 40 years of this <coughs> working its way out, and you can follow it back. Uh, and of course, when Darwin came on the scene, it sort of blew it out of the water. Um, and that, that's why you've never heard of Richard Owen. It's an astonishing case, because he was the most famous biologist in the country. And he was a powerful man in the scientific institutional world. The whole business with the, the, oh, the, the College of Surgeons, he was a very powerful man. He was the man that could make you or break you. If you got on the wrong side of Owen, you'd end up digging up worms in the north of Scotland. <laughs> and he did tell it, he was like that, it was like that. He was the number one, he was El Supremo, what's it, the, the Carpo de Carpo, whatever it is. Uh, and it all disappeared. And no one today has heard of him. Uh, because Darwin threw it all out of the water. Not intentionally. But in fact, what Darwin did had the consequence of blowing all this out of the water. And that's all gone. And so, and it's quite funny really, it's, it's worth remembering is that, it's pretty good. Because there's an awful lot of people today who think they're pretty smart and pretty important. <laughs> and then, yes, well, there you are. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good job, it is like that really, isn't it? So, that's uh, what I wanted to say this morning, really by, um, by way of really trying to bring out what it is that I was trying to do more clearly, and also to clear up the bit of the mess we got into at the end when I, I did too much on the platers and putting that overhead projector thing up. That was not needed. That's actually from another presentation, another, another talk, and it wasn't really part of this. And it confused you. And you Reva was confused. Uh, and, <laughs> and the thing is, just forget that. Just take what I've said today. You'd already done it all. And it's interesting. I, could, uh, I was there. I lost connection. It was sheer tiredness, did too much. Went into free fall, and they couldn't connect with it. <laughs> so I couldn't even see it myself. Uh, and that was it. But a night, a good evening out, uh, a night's sleep, um, oversleep, uh, extra sleep, obviously <laughs> needed, and it's all fitted into place. Thank goodness, because this is the last opportunity, because I'm going, I'm going home tomorrow. Away from the damp. <laughs> oh, going back to the east. Uh, you'd think it was, I was going to the Mystic East, wouldn't you? I'm going to the east. <laughs> I'm going to East Anglia. <laughs>
<laughs> what a fuss. Mm. Right. Now, to, uh, uh, God. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to read all this, don't worry. I'm just reminding me. <laughs> just, just remind myself what I'm doing. <laughs> Alternatively, I could read and you could amuse yourself, but uh, there we are. Um, one of the things I want to talk about briefly is I just want to talk very briefly to tie, tie ends up. There's a few things I want to, to talk about, uh, but not in any great depth. Uh, because uh, well, I want to focus on one thing, first of all, which will lead us into something else. When you get into this, oh, excuse me, it, you realize that, as often happens, uh, Goethe's dynamic way of thinking has been, for the most part, missed. It's, it's, it, people don't get to it. And certainly, they attribute to Goethe ideas and views which he never had. And they also, in some cases, these ideas and views, which they attribute to him, are ideas which are quite contrary to to, to what he did think, almost the opposite of what he thought. <coughs> and so this is, still remains a bit of a puzzle. Ideas which are the opposite of his own vision of the dynamic unit, unity of nature, as we've seen many times, the ground plan idea and so on. Now, <coughs> we can understand this common denominator, this lowest common what's sometimes called the, the minimal commonality, the, the lowest common denominator view, how this arises from the movement of thinking going downstream, it's on the board. We can understand how that arises. And it, it, as I said, it, it could be useful. But the problem is when people uh, think that that's what Goethe's really talking about. Uh, and when people even get past that. It doesn't always, they don't always get to what is essential. There's a very um, big book called The Romantic Conception of Life. The subtitle is something like Science in the Age of Goethe, isn't it? By uh, Robert Richards, who's a historian of science, and he's written a very big, this very big book, years of work, and he knows everything about Goethe. And um, he's now written a book on uh, Heckel, also very good, called, I forget now. He's a very hard-working man, and he's got a lot of praise for his books, and they're very, very good. The Romantic Conception of Life puts Goethe back into the whole context of, of Jena and Weimar and all the people he knew and all of that. Uh, and it's basically, uh, w when he talks about Goethe, he, he, he realizes that what he's doing is something different from looking for the least common denominator. And he says at one point about Goethe, his efforts would also differ from those later anatomists like Richard Owen, who would pursue a general archetypal pattern, but one that illustrated the least common denominator of the vertebrate class. Now, what they did was they applied this not just to, to plants, but to all organisms. So the vertebrates. What do the vertebrates all have in common? The, sense the pentadactyl limb I've just been talking about and so on. And he says that Goethe's efforts differ from that, which what Irma did. And then he goes on to say, by contrast, Goethe conceived the archetype as an inclusive form, and he italicizes that, an inclusive form, a pattern that would contain all the parts really exhibited by the range of different vertebrate species. Now that's not what Goethe's doing. That's putting the peas into the pod. That's putting the cheese back into the milk. That's actually inorganic thinking. It's not dynamic thinking. This idea of an inclusive form, which contains, it's like when we looked at the, the varieties of the plants, and we were talking about that, 
and say, well, are they somehow they're there in the plant already? When the conditions are right, they pop out. No. Uh, it's the plant's response to the environment out of its own potency to be otherwise. It's the germinal response, the embryonic response. Well, it, therefore, if we now go to the archetype, uh, that cannot be an inclusive form that contains all the parts really exhibited by the different vertebrates that there are. It's as if they're all rammed in there in advance and they sort of came out as and when. But what do you say? It is, it is a... I, I've been careful what I said here because I don't want to upset anybody. This guy's, this, this guy's like the Robert Owen of the Gertian studies. You say I could upset him. Such an inclusive form is certainly an improvement on the minimal form of the lowest common denominator. That's this one. It is a step in the right direction but doesn't go far enough. Thinking of an inclusive form leads us to imagine it as, quote, as including all of its possibilities, which actually Robert says on page 453 of his book, including all of its possibilities. The peas are in the pod. We talked about this yesterday. It's pre-formation. They're already there, including all its possibilities. As if it already contained all its potential variations because he's used the word contain in the first quotes, so I'll put that in quotes. We can recognise that this is really thinking in a finished product manner, as if the variations were already there, like peas in a pod waiting to come out. We have discussed the snare of this kind of thinking before, we did it yesterday. It's only too easy to fall into the trap of thinking in this way, whereas to reach Goethe's dynamic way of thinking requires us to take a further step. Richards himself almost takes this step when he says, quote, with the mental eye, we could see the form as dynamic. Yes. Next part of sentence. As containing its infinite variety of transformations within a unity. No. It does not contain the infinite variety of transformations within a unity. Because that's not dynamic. He says, we must see the form as dynamic. Then he gives a totally non-dynamic description of that form. Mm -hmm. and this is another example of those sentences where the first half of the sentence is right, the second half is wrong. Sometimes the first half is wrong. We saw that with Goethe. First half of the sentence is wrong, second half is right. Here, first half is right, second half is wrong. He's going, yes, he's getting... Yes, he's getting that book falling down. That was a good demonstration. That was a good demonstration, wasn't it? <laughs> I don't know what made me do that. Moment of excitement, I suppose. <laughs> I keep taking the tablets, I think. Right. <coughs> what have I put about this? Yes, the form is dynamic. But this is not described adequately by saying that it contains its variety within unity. This is already too late. But then it is very difficult to indicate the dynamical quality of Goethe's organic thinking and all too easy to describe it instead in a downstream way which only has the effect of putting the cheese back into the milk. Uh, I've been very careful there because uh, I think it's possible that uh, Richards will, when this is published, will come across this. I think he's a very big, important man. Uh, I, I don't want to offend him. So I've actually said, well, this is really a good attempt. At, you know, sort of this. And we can sympathise with this and so on. That. What I'm actually thinking is this. Uh, this guy has spent his life uh, decades of his life on Goethe and he hasn't understood not only that he's an honest man and in the book for, it gets to about page 400 and something or other right at the end he brings it up for the first time and there's a footnote and the footnote is and this is honest this is his honesty it's very good he never noticed this it was somebody else that pointed it out to him and the man who had pointed it out to him, and I can't remember his name, is it Boynton? He's at Oxford or Cambridge. And he is writing the, the, the mega biography on Goethe, which is coming out in several volumes. I think two volumes are, I've not read it, this is massive stuff. And the second volume covers about four years of Goethe's life and it's 800 pages long. So it's, it's more detailed than the, de the, the, the Goethe would have ever known. And this is the book. This man's very famous for the book. And it was that man 
that pointed out to Richards that it was an inclusive form, whereas Richards had always been thinking of it as a minimal form. But he was honest enough to put in a footnote that this man who spent his life on Goethe had pointed it out to him, and he realised that was right. But what that means is the man who is doing the biography of Goethe also doesn't understand the dynamics of Goethe's thinking. So you look at this, and you, you say to yourself, look, this is getting ridiculous. Um, because these people are famous. These people have spent decades of their lives working on Goethe. These people are utterly fluent in German. I'm not. Uh, I think I can say it's raining. Uh, something like that. Uh, I could, when I was younger, when I did physics, um, we, we had to do, because a long time ago, you had to do scientific German. In fact, when I did my physics degree, you had to pass an exam in scientific German. And even if you got a first in physics, they wouldn't give you your degree until you passed your German exam. That's to make sure that people took it properly. Because so much work was done, came from Germany. In fact, they stopped it shortly after that because all, all the Germans had gone to America and started writing in English because of a chap called Hitler. And so things had changed. Uh, so we didn't do scientific German. But I did scientific German for two, for two years of school. And then, you had to do, of course, when I got to university, I was, I was okay. And so I could read scientific German. Uh, that, that's, what I, that's what I did. But I don't, I, not German, which, you know, it's much more... To, I mean, with scientific German, it's easy. You don't have to bother the grammar, you know. Um, so that's, a, that's all the only German I had. So here I am. I don't speak German and all that. And yet I'm saying that this understanding of Goethe, uh, that these people haven't understood Goethe, which is a bit outrageous, I know. But they haven't understood Goethe, as I hope uh, what we've done today will actually enable you to see. Um, I, I, I did give a talk last October, about this time actually, at Craig Holridge's Nature Institute in um, upstate New York. And uh, I gave a seminar the following day, and there were two young people there, uh, a, a man and a woman, both very, very nice. And he was working on Hegel's work on aesthetics, and she was working on shelling. And uh, I gave this talk, and in this I really emphasised this dynamic thing, and how people didn't grasp this. And uh, they, were, they, were, they were turned on by this, particularly her. And uh, she came to me afterwards and said that she had this experience while, during this seminar, uh, this, this dynamic thing, and she realised that she, she'd not understood this. She thought she knew what dynamic was. And she realised that she hadn't, hadn't got this at all. And she talked, I could see, I could feel, I knew that she'd experienced it that, that morning. And I mean, she was she was she was lit up with it. And the, she, she said, can, "Can I send you some of my work on Shelling?" And I said, "Yes." I gave her my email address, and she sent this work. It was very interesting. Then later on, uh, she and this chap they were actually an item, and they used to go around together to conferences, um, and there's quite a lot of conferences on this sort of thing in America. And she sent me a, 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 an email saying that they'd heard a talk by um, I never remember his. Robert Richards and it was a very good talk but it was quite clear that in exactly what I said he had not understood Goethe's dynamical thinking so they went and told him about <laughs> 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 well an American you know they go out and do things don't they now? and they went and told him <laughs> I'm sure he was very very interested <laughs> oh dear <laughs> Uh, I mean, these two young people are telling him that he had uh, that he hadn't that he'd missed the dynamics he got to think. <laughs> the thought of it, you know, wonderful. So uh, <laughs> we don't know what the repercussions are going to be. <laughs> well, anyway, because I've actually named it in in this book because it's in, you know I think it just needs to be brought out. But I, that's why I've tried to say very nice things like. This is certainly an improvement on the previous idea. <laughs> so, this, it's a step in the right direction. Well done, encouraging science. Not saying, this is a load of crap. <laughs> 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 but,
But uh, when all the, the laughter's over, um, we've got this question which does sort of come up. Uh, uh, this is a bit extraordinary. How is this the case? That this gets missed by people who are far, far better at doing this stuff than I am. And that's what I want to just try to look into because it's such a, re such a remarkable thing. There must be something there to be understood about this. <laughs> so why, what are the factors which make Goethe's way of seeing so difficult to catch that although it's right in front of us, when we think we've got it, we've actually got a kind of counterfeit form because this, this inclusive form is a counterfeit form. <clears throat> and why does it get missed? Well, I think there are quite a few contributing factors to this and it's, an, it's quite enlightening to see them. First of all, there's the fairly obvious one and that is, well, the dynamics of thinking itself leads us away from it. What we've been talking about all the time, upstream to downstream, in seeing, we, our attention becomes focused on what is seen. It, experience has this vector quality. It goes outwards, it's centrifugal. So when we see, seeing goes to what we see, and we overlook the seeing of what is seen. <clears throat> um, <coughs> in saying, attention goes to what is said, away from the saying, and we overlook the saying of the said, and so on. In other words, the dynamic of experience is to go to the finished product. <coughs> That can't be otherwise because that's the dynamic of experience itself. <coughs> and so that in itself <coughs> must lead us away from this intrinsic dynamic of upstream picture and down towards this, this commonality here, this minimal commonality, which he could then correct by saying, well, it's not like that. It's, it's actually an inclusive form, so he gets away from that. It doesn't, doesn't really get up to it. So there's a natural built-in tendency in the dynamics of thinking itself to, to move away from the dynamic to focus on the end result. And in latching on to the outcome, we thereby overlook the dynamics. So you could say, in this way, the dynamics of thinking promotes its own eclipse. You get the idea? And obviously that's very well known in phenomenology and that's what we, one of the things that we were, have been, been looking at. So we've done that already in the phenomenology and we can see how this tendency to miss the dynamic is almost built in to the movement of thinking itself in a natural way. So it's to be expected. That's why in phenomenology we have to shift the focus of attention back upstream. That's one thing I want to say. But there's much more to it than that. Um, and the second one <coughs> is, I think, really quite fundamental. <coughs> because <coughs> Goethe actually does something that's very different from the usual way of thinking. Um, this is something that you will be doing um, next week with Margaret. So this is another important reason uh, for doing this. Um, what Goethe does is that he, he redirects attention uh, away from 
he redirects attention into the sensory experience. His whole way of working is to bring attention back into the sensory, away from the verbal intellectual mind. He focuses, for example, if you're concerned with looking at the leaves of a plant, what you would do would be to look at these leaves, and you would look at these leaves actively. You would spend a lot of time looking at them. You would explore, it's as if you're exploring the leaves with your eyes, as if your eyes are lots and lots of fingers that are going all over the leaves. One way of putting it is to say, you plunge into seeing. Usually, as we are, we're pretty passive in our seeing. Although it isn't true, we actually live as if seeing is something that just happens to us passively. Here you have to be intentionally active in seeing. It's sometimes called active seeing to indicate this. It's not just passively letting the look of things come to you. But you have to go into it intentionally. It's also sometimes called reverse seeing because you have to go this way into the seeing intentionally and explore things. But you do this with the sensory. Now, <clears throat> this, this um, reverses the normal direction of the learning process, which psychologists have discovered sort of goes this way. This is the psychology of it. We start off with the experience of something, uh, the actual thing itself, and it can be quite vivid. So we experience a leaf. We would experience another leaf and so on and that. And eventually what happens is, when we've done this a bit, instead of experiencing the, in, the, the sensory qualities of individual leaves, what happens is we just have the category leaf. And the individual experience gets tuned out. And it just triggers the category leaf. And so we see leaf or leaves. But what we actually experience is the verbal intellectual category and not the leaves that are there. And this is something which, if you say this, we say to ourselves, no, 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 that isn't true. But experiments show that it is true. There's a very famous experiment which was done, I think, in the 1940s, a time when a lot of these experiments were done because they said money was available by Bruner and Postman. It's called the Anomalous Card Experiment. A pack of playing cards. They have some people in a room and they have a pack of playing cards and they put up picture, playing cards one at a time on a, on a device rather like this uh, overhead, overhead projector. So it projects onto a screen. It's called a tachistoscope because what you can do though, it puts them up only at a certain time and then it goes and then another one comes up and then it goes and then another one comes up. And tachist means swift in Greek. And you can check, the point about it is, you can vary the amount of time that the cards are visible. And uh, people are asked to write down the cards that they see. Seven of hearts, queen of clubs, five of spades, and so on and so on. Unknown to the people doing this, some cards have been put in there which are anomalous. That is, they don't really exist. So they put in um, a red five of spades, and so on. And they put these up, and that's it. And then people write them down. And when they went through what people had done, they found that there was no mention of these anomalous cards. <clears throat> and that is because people, well, you had a five of them, um, five, red five of spades. People put down either five of hearts or five of diamonds. Now, at first, the people doing the experiments thought that what had happened was that they'd seen these and thought, no, no, that can't be right. I must have got that wrong. And they'd interpreted it as whatever it was. But as they proceeded with these experiments, they realized that this wasn't true. Surprisingly, they were seeing a five of hearts, seeing a five of diamonds, where there was, in fact, 
a red five of spades. <coughs> they weren't seeing that funny card and interpreting it as the other, the normal one. They were actually seeing the normal one directly, which won't surprise us now because we've been through all this sort of stuff, um, seeing, seeing the idea. You think you're seeing, you see, a playing card is an idea. It's not a natural object, it's a cultural artifact. So, if you had a culture where this wasn't there, they wouldn't be able to see a playing card. Oh, they'd see something all right, but they wouldn't see a playing card. Um, so, when we see it, we just see it. So, see, seeing as, we see it as that, but it's not an interpretation. We don't add the interpretation on. So, what they then did was they slowed it down so that they um, had the cards visible for a longer period of time. And uh, what happened was that people began to get disturbed. Some got panicky, some got irritable, and said things like, what's going on here? They're so funny. Well, then what's going on? Um, and that was a surprise. And then eventually, the people saw what was going on. Some of them were very angry. Because they said, you're messing with my mind. Because when you experience the change, you don't experience it as something that happens out there when it doesn't really affect you. You experience it as if something's happened inside your mind. So these, these psycho freaks out there, these psychologists, they've got, they're, they're tampering with your mind. Um, it either makes you angry or panicky. Um, and so this is all a bit of a revelation. And then they realized that no, we actually see the category, that we see the idea directly. And that's the normal process of learning. We start from individual experiences, but eventually we tune out the details of the individual experiences simply in favour of the abstract category of which they then become representative. So we, don't ex we think we're experiencing the world. Well, we're not. We're experiencing the categories much more directly. The world is like a very thin, faint thing there, and the categories are what come up strongly. So you're walking down the, down the road, you see something, you, you think you've seen that thing. Well, you have, because it's stimulated. But what you really get is the category. You haven't looked at that thing. You haven't looked at its details, at its existence at all. Now, of course, this is entirely necessary. Because this process, uh, this process whereby we go from the actual things, sensory things, to the category, this, what we call the idea, where we experience that primarily, this is what's called the process of automatization or the process of habituation by psychologists. And it's the normal learning sequence. It's normal. And if we didn't do this, we wouldn't be able to cope with the world. If, I mean, if I was involved in a kind of experience where I was seeing the sensory details of everything, there's no way I would yet have got out of that room there into here to give a talk. Because I would have been overwhelmed by the sensory detail of everything in my experience. I would not be able to get through that door. I would still be in the room going over all these sensory details. So I can be here because I'm living in terms of categories. And that's that enables us to live our lives, so it's not to be not. But, it's good news, bad news. It's got a downside. And, as with everything, it's suitable for some things, for living your life, but it's not suitable necessarily for everything. An artist will know, a painter will have in mind, that you will certainly have to go beyond that to start doing painting. And of course, this is what the, what the artists do. Um, but then, that's a kind of activity. When the artist stops doing art and goes back to her life, she just thinks, when she goes to the kitchen to cook, or whatever she's going to do, I don't know, uh, but I'll say she goes to the kitchen, because it's sexist, it implies women go to the kitchen. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, anyway. So what happens really with Goethe is that he reverses this. He goes in the opposite direction. He suspends the category and plunges into the sensory experience. Now, in order to do this, there's nothing you can do about the verbal intellectual mind. You can't say, right, I'll switch that off. 
because that's the verbal intellectual mind saying it's going to switch itself off, and it's certainly not going to do that, because its interest is definitely not in ceasing to exist. Um, uh, uh, what you do is you redirect attention. This is the great miracle we have, this faculty of attention. So you redirect attention into the sensory by uh, active seeing. And what will happen is the verbal intellectual mind will throw up all sorts of stuff to try to stop you. And don't try to deal with that. Because then your attention will have gone from the sensory into the verbal intellectual mind. So you think, hang on a minute, I'll just deal with the verbal intellectual mind. No, I am going to do this, so shut up. Well, if you go back to the verbal intellectual mind, if you give it any attention at all, naturally it, it grows. So what you have to do is do put your attention to this. And all the stuff that comes up, just keep attending to the sensory experience and let the rest go. Now, one of the ways in which this comes up is that people can experience a huge reluctance to do this work. They really don't want to do it. What usually happens is you hear about it, you think, wow, fantastic, that's what I want. And when it comes to doing it, you find you don't want to do it. Uh, there's all sorts of things come up to you from the mind as well. You don't know to do, no, you don't need to do that. You, you know what this is, you don't need that. <clears throat> and this resistance is very interesting because it shows that you're going in the direction of de-automatization, mm. dishabituation. So you're going completely against the grain and that's why we experience resistance. And then people get upset by this and say, does this mean I'm a morally inferior person and so on and that? No, it does not. This is a normal process. You're going to go against, actually doing it, you're going to go against the whole process of automatization, habituation, you're going to dishabituate yourself. And you really don't want to do that. Once you've got into this, <clears throat> what happens is it can become very lively. Suddenly something, it's as if it wakes up. Your senses become awakened. And you become aware in your senses. And then... You, you get the feeling, oh, this is rather nice. Uh, but you have to cross a barrier to do that. Now, that's the first stage in what Goethe does, but only the first stage. That he then takes it further <coughs> from active seeing into the second stage, which can be done in all sorts of ways. <coughs> and so the fact that I talk about it in one way uh, you must realize that I'm only talking about it this way as, oh, for example, this way. So next week, when you're with Margaret, she'll do a lot of this in practice. She'll be doing it. So it might be different. Um, but that doesn't mean anything at all. <clears throat> the second stage is that Goethe then <clears throat> repeats what he's observed or what he's done in imagination. Now, it's important here that whatever you've done, you put it aside. So if you've been looking at leaves or whatever it is, you then put, you might have them as often happens. You'll be doing this next week with, I presume you'll be doing this with, with the various sequence of leaves of a plant. Because the leaves itself, in, in flowering plants, the leaves themselves go through a process of metamorphosis. And you can see this. And usually one starts with that. I don't know whether Margaret starts with that or she doesn't. She certainly used to. Um, and it's quite common to do that. And it's a very nice experience because you can actually go up the leaves of the plant and you, you can see the movement. You come to, it's lovely. You can see the movement. You see the hidden figure and you experience it as a movement. It's the movement of metamorphosis in the leaves. Because um, I'm not doing the Goethean science. I don't, uh, obviously I don't do that. I have to deal with well, what I have to deal with. I have to deal with and so on and that. But, <coughs> but there again, it's, um, it's just all come back to me. Sorry, I'm flooding out now. When I used to do this, the experience and, and so on and that. And th this thing, of, because the, the hidden figure's there, but it's the movement. It's what we've been talking about. Okay. Um, so then you put those leaves aside. And you um, must do that to begin with. And then you, you rebuild the experience actively in imagination. It's got to be exact. 
it's not a science. Wait, the idea is not that you, you you try not to leave anything out. Very difficult. So you need memory for that. You t <laughs> don't make me laugh at that. <laughs> you need also to try not to put anything in. It's not there. Equally difficult. Uh, you must not embellish it. It's not what we usually mean by imagination. You know, wow, this world is boring. I'll imagine it much better. So it's not that. You've got to try to imagine it as exactly as you can. And you, and it doesn't matter how you do it. There are different people have different things. Some people get very strong visual images in the when they do this. Some people don't get images. Um, I get images. And when I was first introduced to this years ago, long before I'd heard of Goethe, by the man I mentioned, J.D. Bennett, in a quite different context, this visualization involving... Anyway. And he was a master of this and taught us and so on and that. It was a big thing. And after a few years, one day, he shocked us all by saying, you know, I have never had any idea what anyone means by a mental image. And this is the man who taught us visualization. And he said, the people think you have to have pictures. You don't. People think you, what you're doing is you're actually thinking it. But thinking is active, not thinking of it. Or definitely not thinking about it. That's really what this is not. I'll close my eyes and think about it. Definitely not. But you can actually think it. And for those who don't know what that means, you have to explore that. For other people, they simply get uh, this image, which actually is also a form of thinking. But it can happen without images. And he didn't have images. And he was the one that taught us visualization. and was the best of all of it. So when I, I mention this because sometimes people get very upset because they don't get images, and other people do. And they think, that, again, there's something wrong with them. Am I, am I an inferior person? No. Have I been born without a gene? No. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Um, so whatever way it happens, this is what you do. Now, in doing this, you're clearly taking yourself further into the sensory because you're focusing its exact sensorial imagination. So you're deepening the sensory contact by actually taking the sensory within yourself. All the time you're focusing on, on, on it. So you think you're going out, you're focusing on the leaf, the leaf, the leaf, the leaf. But because you're doing this inwardly, what you're actually doing is bringing the leaf form into yourself. And this th therefore gives you a much deeper, but you don't notice that, this gives you a much deeper connection. You're really beginning to participate the leaf form. And then you can go after that. Very often people then go back uh, to the sensory experience of the leaves. And you will then find, after it takes a bit of practice, that your sensory experience may well be enriched by this process. And you begin to see things which are there, uh, uh, whatever it is, in a more awakened way, a livelier way. And then you can go around this cycle. So this is again reciprocal. Each interweaves the other. It's a, it's a process. And when you get into it, you begin to realize, as with all these processes, you can only say so much about it. And then you have to get into doing it. And in the doing of it, in the practice, <coughs> then you learn all sorts of things about it. It teaches you through the, through the doing of it. And then you begin to realize it's rather more subtle than you first thought it was and so on. Um, that's, so that's the, that's, the, the, that's the way that it works. Um, and this develops a different kind of mind, which is attuned to the sensory. When people get into this visualization, and as I, say, I did this almost, certainly, uh, almost 10 years before I heard of Goethe. So when I came to Goethe, and I, I think I've written about this in the introduction, to that book. When I came to Goethe, I suddenly recognized what he was talking about. 
So, and, and then of course people thought I got it all from Goethe, but because they forgot Goethe, everything comes from Goethe. But uh, no, I, I'd already, already had this. I, I did mention this in the introduction to the wholeness of nature, that I'd, I'd learned this, this and so on. So when I came to Goethe, I recognized this. Um, <clears throat> but Goethe does it, is, is a tremendous way. Of, uh, you can, once you get into Goethe, you can just simply take off on it. And so this is the whole process, therefore, of deautomatization, dishabituation, bringing yourself into the sensory world. Now, the big thing about the sensory world is that this is where the livingness of things is. And so your experience and your thinking becomes much more lively, much more alive, much more attuned to what is living. Because the senses bring us into contact with what is alive in things. And that can be anything. I mean, this thing people have this experience that, <coughs> that the stones suddenly seem to have being and so on and that. You know this sort of thing. Well, it's through the senses that that happens to the verbal intellectual mind to talk about the experience of the stones as having a kind of presence and being is just rubbish. It's through the senses that sense of aliveness comes. <coughs> and the verbal intellectual mind is, brings us into contact with what is dead in things. It, it, <laughs> this is most awkward for us to, to, to have to, uh, to see this because we think that the verbal intellectual mind is the most wonderful thing of all. So to learn that what it does is it brings us into contact with what is dead is <laughs> not very nice. And there will be many objections to this because the verbal intellectual mind doesn't like to hear that being said about itself. And, but you can learn to see this. So it brings us into contact with things that are not lively, not, in a, not a living way. And therefore you that's why through doing this you come to this dynamic understanding, this sense of movement in life. That's life. On the verbal intellectual mind, you just have the surface of things, and everything is static. And all you can do is draw off what things have in common. That's all you can do with the verbal intellectual mind. It deals with what is finished, and thinks in a dead, uh, dead kind of way. It's the perfect kind of mind for dealing with the inorganic world, for the logic of solids. <clears throat> but what Goethe is doing, therefore, goes in a, a direction where he is, as he put it, you have, you have to create the organ of perception that you need. But through working with nature, nature will create in you the organ of perception that you need for doing that. Again, it's participative. You start off doing this with nature. You've got to initiate it. And then through working with nature in this way, nature in you will help to produce the very organ that's needed for doing what you set out to do. It's, there's a word for this, Again, it's this interweaving things. It's participative. Um, it's an extraordinary thing. Uh, this is this is this is what this, what happens. So the the person doing it is themselves. Um, now there are lots of words for this, aren't there? Developed through doing this. Um, so the scientist, if we're going to talk about it as Gertian science, and I'm not at all sure myself that we should anymore, as I've indicated. But the person doing this goes through a process of development themselves. They are enhanced through doing it. This is unlike with ordinary science, where you have the faculties and you use them, but you're not enhanced. What you actually do is enhance your ego by becoming terribly clever and thinking, gosh, I can do algebraic, algebraic topology. Aren't I fantastic? You see? But this is different. Um, uh, this kind of process of growth is, uh, is a big thing in the German cultural tradition. It's called Bildung, um, a word which has all sorts of connotations and meanings that don't really come across in English. But self-formation is one of them. But think of it just simply, what I said, that it, you, 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 the person doing it becomes enhanced in their being through doing this. And this is the doorway to doing Goethean science. The first thing to do is to get, to get the right instrument. Now, one of the, the real reasons why people are against using instruments is when, you, when you're relying on microscopes and telescopes, you're not doing this. And what the Gertinists say, and this is the good side of it, is that 
You are yourself the instrument. You have to be formed to be the instrument. So if you're relying on telescopes and microscopes, that's taking you away from that. That's the good side of that. The bad side of that is they then dogmatize that and say, because it's methodological. But no, they then dogmatize it and say it is wrong to look down at microscopes and so on. That is not the Goethean way and so on. It's, it's not. If, if the work you're doing requires you to do that, you do that. And then actually what you do, you can then do all this Goethean work with what you see down a microscope. Uh, but they don't seem to grasp at that point. I don't want to get into that sort of thing again. Um, but this is... Do they wear glasses? <laughs> yeah, 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 they do, yeah. Good thought. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. That's marvellous. Couldn't have reached a better point to go and have coffee.